Thank you. So, I don't know all of you in this room, but I'm going to give a couple shout outs to a few people that I know. And, um, and just because, and, I, and the whole idea is for you all to get to know one another. But I will tell you that I will be talking about a family map and a genogram here. And lo and behold, my website, um, people contact me for a variety of different reasons. And right in front of me is a gentleman by the name of Scott Wallach. I have not met him or haven't seen him since maybe I was, or never met him. He was related to my real father. And in coming to this conference, I got an email for, through my website saying, hi, Cousin Scott is coming. And I reached out. So I'm very honored to have someone who definitely is from my past, because my real father died when I was eight years old. Um, over here, I've got Todd Zalkin. Um, my company's called All About Interventions, and his is All In Interventions. Um, he's an interventionist and also an author from Long Beach. I have uh, good friends from Houston um, in the audience. I don't know where Dr. James Flowers just now disappeared. So he had a phone call, so now we're going to call him out and say, we said hi to Kenneth Palms, and he's also opening an outpatient program in uh, San Diego, which is really where I called home for over 46 years. And in the back, I have good friends from, oh, they're not saying I'm good friends, because I will talk about some of the clients that I tend to send them, um, from Hammock Valley and Champion Recovery, Deb Kelts. And if you ever have any chronic pain, most complicated medical complications with the most um, outrageous families, it's a really good place to send. In fact, when I call them, they duck. So with the time that we're here together, I thought I wanted you to get to know each other. So in front of you are awesome cards, because each one of you are awesome. So I just want to take, and I'm just really, really quick, I'd like you to go and in, take an awesome card. I don't have enough to go around. I don't even know where they all went. But when you have one, go to somebody, introduce yourself, and you've got under three minutes to share with somebody about a complicated family that you might have worked with or you know. One, two, three, go. Woo, it's your turn to talk. Hi. How are you doing? Go, I want you to talk with Garrett. Can you talk with this young lady? Because there's no one to talk with. Bring, bring her in. Bring her in over here. Thank you. Thank you, Garrett. I got like this one. Absolutely. Thank you. Hi there. Come on in. Welcome. I'm Louise. Everybody's just talking. That's all they're going to do for a whole hour and a half. They're actually asking us. I don't know why this got bumped or how this moved this way. There. We're good. you had your way, you would all talk the entire time to one another. 
Does anybody want to quickly share? I mean, in fact, how many in the room are clinicians? How many people own treatment centers? How many people work in treatment centers? How many people are happy they're not in treatment? <laughs> I just was wanting to see if you were awake or not. Okay, anybody want to share in three set in like about less than 60 seconds someone that stumped you? A client, multi yes. And you are? Uh, I'm Robert Phillips. I'm the uh, intervention specialist with American Addiction Center. Hi, Robert Phillips. I, uh, I'm the one and only with right now. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I had an individual uh, outside of Seattle, Washington, named Stephanie Maddox. Uh, knew I was coming. I do an educational model, knew I was coming. Uh, I walked in the front door and he jumps out of the second floor window and barricades himself in the, uh, in the garage. Good. So this gentleman works for American Addiction Centers, and his complicated intervention had to deal with a meth addict who jumped out of a two-story window, who it took a long time to get to yes. And I love the fact, and he does an, what we call an invitational model, and I'm going to be talking about that because I, I want you to know that every single day, no matter who you are, as long as you're in this business, you are inviting people to change. Okay? You invite them to change in your clinical rooms. Um, they get invited to change by the legal system. They get invited to change in hospitals. But every single day, we are inviting people to change. So when people start talking about an invitational method, I want you to know that we all invite people to change and that we're all geared on getting to yes. So today, we're going to have to learn multi-ecological issues. Why? Because I was a social work professor, and I believe that people live in a community, in an environment, and have a systems approach. We'll have to learn, at times, how to prioritize intervention strategies. What comes first? Especially when we're dealing with multiple issues at the same time. And I hope to give you a lot of different case examples, so that, or, and I want interaction. And I will walk around. This is a little bit, I'm used to like walking all around, so I will do that. And I'd like to help you identify therapeutic processes for interventions. But I want you all, again, to look around. Or look at me. OK? Look at me. So Arthur, you, along with everybody else, decided in the first seven seconds when you looked at me, whether or not you could trust me, whether or not I might be good to work with you. It doesn't matter what my credentials are, doesn't matter who I am, you and everybody else, make no mistake about it, that's evidence-based. People make very quick decisions and most of the time, when we're dealing with intervention, we're dealing with people on the phone. So they're deciding through the tone of your voice, through the sound of your heart, and through it. And what you'll learn today, at least for me, is that complicated interventions are as much an art as they are a science. And I believe there's processes. I'm not going to teach you a model. I'll share with you what I do but if you came looking for a particular model, you're not in the right place. Um, because I believe you have to start where your client is. What's your name? Josie. Where Josie is. What's your name? Christina. Where Christina is. Where, what's your name? <coughs> where Susie is. Where Shia is. Where Todd is. Where Ed is. Where Mary is. You've got to start where they are. 
And in the moment you superimpose your model and you don't start where that person is, you're not with them. You're not going to be able to join up. So one of the things we have to take a uh, look at is we've got to understand that when one disorder is acting out, another one could be doing something else. So I have a one case example um, might be I had a woman once, and we'll be talking more about her. Um, she had a substance abuse disorder. How do I know that? She was drinking two bottles of wine a night. But at the same time, she just liked to shop. And for fun, she spent $30,000, but not like on one Hermes purse, which I could understand, or one <laughs> Chanel purse that I could buy at the Bellagio. No, she went to an antique warehouse in Solana Beach, and I change everything, in Solana Beach, California, and she bought what, in the word Jewish, I don't know what it is in another language, she bought 300 shachkis, like 300 different things. And at the same time, she wanted a divorce. She was separated, and she didn't like her husband. There's, that's a lot of multiple things. We're gonna hold on to her for a minute. What do we do? And we're also going to talk about what is triangulation of data. So triangulation of data just means that I'm going to get information from multiple sources when I work. Because what one person says may or may not be the whole truth. And I will tell you about a process I use, which is called portraiture, where I interview everyone individually. And I hold a portrait of a person. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about picking the right treatment center. Well, I'm blessed in the respect that I'm not employed by any treatment center, and then I'm cursed because I'm not employed by any treatment center, which means I have no fiduciary responsibility in the world except to my clients and trying to pick the right one. Because not all treatment centers are alike. Not all treatment centers are made for the, um, that particular client. Some really excel with different things, and it's your responsibility to learn. I'm blessed because I get to travel around the country. I get to visit a lot of treatment centers, and I get to do staff development. But there are people like me and organizations, so you can call them and say, hey, what do you think about this place? Because everybody has a great website. Everybody can save the entire world. Did you notice lately? You know, so it's hard to discriminate. And that person calling you is calling you in pain. They're wounded. So you need to know, know that. So we're going to think about what came first, mental health, substance abuse, legal, physical, family. Well, you can do what we call, uh, I do a retrospective analysis, which is a biopsychosocial history of a family. And I'm getting this backwards, and I'll talk to you about how you get that. And you might not know what came first, because someone could be in a substance-induced psychosis, right? Certainly your guy was in a substance-induced psychosis. Like one time I brought to Newfound Life, I was so lucky. We, we had um, a gentleman we were doing an intervention on, and he was really interesting. He had mental health disorder. He thought, um, well, he was a little paranoid. He would paint beautiful um, portraits of flowers for his mother, really, really a talented artist. His hair was about down to my back in dreadlocks. And when he was using meth, he would show up and he would punch a wall in, right? And so the day that my, my teammate and I went to do interventions, oh, by the way, I don't do interventions alone. I have a real strong opinion that you should be working with a team that it's a little arrogant to do them all by yourself. You're not a cowboy running in to save. And also, there's a good clinical reason why you do them with someone else, and that's because someone should stay behind to process with that accountability team that you've put together. And you need to be able to work with them because you've just had an event. And it's not like you take the, that person and you ride off. But with this first young man I'm talking about, we didn't know who would show up at this intervention. Would the one that punches in the hole, because he was high on meth. It was probably the easiest intervention I've ever done in my entire life that was complicated. And he had a mental health disorder. Why? Because we came and he was sort of like so out of it, I said, do you want to go? And he said yes, and so we took him. 
I don't think Mr. Spatola ever forgave us for bringing him to him, but he did a great job with him um, and everything. But if he had shown up and been the other one, the angry one, we wouldn't have been able to get to the square one. So we never know who's going to show up. The other thing that's so important is everybody, how many of you in here know how to do a family map or a genogram? Okay, how many of you do that right away in your treatment center with your clients? How many of you do them with your clients in treatment centers? Okay, that is great because that's why if you don't do them, they should be done. How many of you do them immediately with families that you're starting to work with? Immediately. Only two of you in the room. I'm going to encourage you. It's not hard to learn how to do family maps. I, I do teach them all over the country. The, and there's programs that you can use. They're very fancy. Um, I tend to use, when I do a family map, I'm starting, I talk to a family, I say, tell me about this, and I get it filled in the blanks. And what I ask for all the time are multiple issues. I ask, what is substance abuse? Has anyone experienced a substance abuse? Has anyone experienced a mental health disorder? Has anyone experienced, has anyone acted out sexually? Has anyone had any sudden death? Who's died suddenly? Has there been divorce? And by the way, can I pick on you for a minute? You're going to have to put these away for now. Oh, let me think about this. How long do we stay on our phones? How many of you have your phones out right now? Tell the truth. Put them away. Because when I'm going to know, I couldn't because I can't live without them. Right now, if you're going to do a genogram, it's really, really important for you to take a look a digital history because we've got two and three year olds who won't know how to communicate because guess I what I've just given them to shut up. And so you want to take a look because that's an assessment. So this is a little prettier one, but in truth, when you start talking to a family about their family map, that's what they start to see. Actually, that was my family, right? Look at that cute little girl. That was me. Okay? <laughs> And I got to dance like a washerwoman, uh, a, a cleaning lady, a china girl, um, right through mental health, substance abuse, and disasters. Okay? And that was my mom. God bless her. She lived in Vegas. Um, and in fact, she did what we call geographics. Anybody know what a geographic, when things got tough, she got up and moved. And um, she was like Auntie Mame. So she, but when you start doing a family map in someone's head and you're doing all your stick drawings, et cetera, et cetera, make no mistake, people are seeing pictures in their head. Like right next to that little girl with that, there's a little chubby girl, that was me, but that's right after my father committed suicide, okay? So when I started doing, when you start doing a family map, I want you to know that people are seeing different pictures of their life. And you got to be careful with that. Go slower. And different family members can fill in different parts of it. But people don't see them as lying figures or as those fancy computer programs are. But you can get the most wealth of information, and it really is outstanding to help your clients because your client thinks, or the identified loved one thinks, they're the only one. They're the only one with the problem. But then they find out they had four uncles who went bankrupt. Oh, money, I forgot to tell you, we've got to talk about money. And they went bankrupt from their pool business because they drank it into oblivion. And by the way, they had sex with everybody in the neighborhood. So you wonder why they're sexual acting out. So family history with triangulation of data means we're going to talk to multiple people. We, if there is any previous treatment experiences, we're going to try and see whether we can get some information from them. You're going to, like, when you're doing it, if someone has been abstinent, what is the, what's the longest period of abstinence they've had? Was there ever a time? And you're going to try and establish what came first. It's sometimes it doesn't really matter, but you're going to have to decide. And obviously, if someone is, has, a, and notice I say substance abuse disorder, or mental health disorder, if someone chooses to term themselves alcoholic addict, those are personal terms. But evidence suggests that when you experience, people experience a substance abuse, a mental health disorder, a shopping disorder, a process disorder. 
That's not who they are. That's part of them. And we find that people respond better when you talk, characterize people as part of their experience and talk to them in that way. So you want to obtain a, what we call a longitudinal history. What happened? I use a methodology called portraiture. It's a qualitative research methodology. I used it when I was interviewing women who had been widowed at a young age. It was developed by a woman named Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot. She's the only endowed chair at Harvard University that has a chair in her name. She's wonderful. She's African American. If you want to read anything she's written, she's written The Lives and Loss of Liberation. But what it really means is we're going to be in conversation. And I'm going to ask you a little bit about you first, because I really want to learn about you. And after that, it's not that I'm doing anything so special, but I want to know. I want to know about heart, hurt, and hope. I'm going to ask you, because people don't call interventionists, by the way, because they're having a good day. Has anyone ever called you and you're an interventionist and they just called you up because you're having such a great day? No. Interventionists, by the way, get called when? Crisis. In crisis. But when else do they get called? They get called when the admissions team can't close. Make no mistake about it. If an admissions team can close, that admission, you're not getting a phone call. You don't. It's because they're too complicated. So what it does, it assumes that we're co-collaborators in this story. And what I want to learn is, why is your heart hurting? Tell me that in behavioral terms. What made you call today? What, what is it that's, what's, what, why your heart is hurting? And tell me something special about your loved one. What was special about it? You know, if I think back, if someone, I really wish there was someone who could have saved my father's life. He committed suicide. But if I thought back as a little girl, what I was powerless over, maybe if someone had asked what was special about him, well, he carried me on my shoulders. That was the last time I saw him. Could I have said, Daddy, please don't go? I don't know. Probably not. But if I was an interventionist, maybe I would have wanted to know. What's special about your sister? What's special about your brother? What's special about your loved one? And what makes your heart hurt? My heart hurts because I'm so powerless. <coughs> They're so involved in a fantasy love avoidance of sex addiction. I don't know what to do. They won't listen. They keep on going. This is what they've done. What can I do to help? What actual behaviors? They wrap the, the car around the tree. They ran out nude into the street. You all have stories you can tell. And then we interview as many people as we possibly can. So when we think about interventions and we think about complex process interventions or complex interventions, it's not done. I'm in a textbook, and it says interventions are not made for TV. I apologize if any of you have been on TV. And honestly, I'd love to be on TV. So that's not the issue. But they're not made for TV, and they don't automatically happen in 53 minutes. They can, they can take place over time. This gentleman just shared one that took over a period of weeks. We've had some that have taken as long as four months. A lot of things have to happen. A lot of resource has to be gone. A lot of boundaries. And if you don't change the family or you don't change the accountability team, it's really, really hard. They may be volatile. They may involve court, medical. So you must, and again, you must know treatment centers. So we know there's all these mind-altering substances, right? What's your favorite? What's your pleasure? Like, here we are in Sodom and Gomorrah. Like, I lived here as a kid, right? I worked at Vegas Village. And then we are, I am talking about sex, gambling, um, all kinds of cross shopping, internet addiction, right? Which is sort of like the slot machine going up and down and clicking, clicking, clicking. In the middle of the Bellagio. Uh, I, what could be a better place for field study? How many of you are doing field research? Uh, come on, I won't, I won't. And food, 
We know that with food, you've got to let, as my good colleague once said, you've got to let the tiger out of the tank three times a day. You can't avoid food. Some of the other ones, you may be able to become abstinent on. So you really need to know the differences in each one of these. Um, there's 10 criteria for disorders, if you just think about it. There's, and I'm sure you all know this, so I'm going to go over this real fast. I don't want this to be boring. Loss of control. You know, I, I know, I'll stop tomorrow, right? We, we don't need to do this anymore, right? No, we, we don't, we don't. Compulsive behavior, doing something over and over and over again. How many times a day will someone volunteer to say they check their email? One? 20? How, 50? How many times? What? Six hours worth? Five, five, times. five times a day? Okay, so I'm going to invite all of you to see whether or not you can cut that down because that's a compulsive. And the inability to fulfill obligations. Well, I'll be right with you. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I can't really do this presentation right now because I got to go check my email. You know, it could be that it's really, really important. It could be something else going on. Um, we're addicted to something that takes the pain away, okay? Uh, just like denial comes into play for what reason? Why does denial come into play? Pardon me? Hard to face. Hard to face. Denial, when something terrible happens, like a death, a sudden death, you often hear people say, oh, they can't be gone, right? It, it's, denial originally comes into play to help cushion a blow. It's not a bad thing. It's, a, it's one of those defense mechanisms. When denial goes haywire, and I don't look at the fact that with a process addiction, I went over to the crystal shops. Anybody been to the crystal shops? Uh-huh. Does anyone know where the crystal I know where the crystal shops are. And I took out my American Express card, and I took out my Visa MasterCard, and I took out any other card that I seem to have had in my wallet. And I had a great time for at least an hour and a half. Came back with all these designer bag things, but I couldn't stop. And then after I look and say, what the hell am I going to do with all this stuff? You know? And how can I do it? And the consequence is I don't have the money really to pay for it. So I just ran it up. And what are the losses and what are we losing? So what part of us doesn't become whole? What part of us are we not willing to, to do? So when we, how many of you, you all know what process addictions are, right? So I don't need to re-preach to, um, and how, and so sometimes people will say, well, we don't really discover a process addiction until after the onion starts peeling off. Um, a lot of times we know, um, how many of you know what 13th stepping is? <laughs> how many of you are guilty of 13th stepping? I'll turn my back again. Okay? But we do know, for example, a lot of you have young, how many of you have young adult treatment centers? One, two in the room. So you know that those young men and those young women, they want to hook up, right? And they also know that they're really prey to unhealthy attachments. And that as soon as they get clean, the first thing they want to do is hook up with somebody in recovery, and it's really unhealthy. That's why gender-specific treatment is so good for young adults. But at the same time, 13-stepping, they don't know who they are. And that's a time when, if you've heard Lori Jean Glass talk about the crazy train, <coughs> love avoidance, love attachment, it's a great time to begin to take a look at attachment issues. You can't do that right away. You need to do it something else. There's always, always, and the difference, there's always shame and guilt attached with any disorder, and sometimes there's just shame and guilt attached because that's how you were brought up. That somehow or other, you weren't enough. Or somehow or other, something happened in your family of origin, and you, had, and you were growing up with a life of needs. I just shared with you 
when I was eight, my father killed himself. But what I didn't know until I was almost an adult is he followed in his mother and father's footsteps. Poor guy. They each drank a bottle of Clorox because they couldn't, they came out of the Depression era. I didn't know that until I was much older. But when you're eight, guess what you think? If only I could have done. That's the magical thinking of an eight-year-old. And sometimes you feel guilty because you didn't know what to do, because again, you were powerless. So oftentimes, we grow up, and the stories that, the, and the stories that you're gonna learn about your clients, about their families, maybe stories where they feel ashamed, they've never been able to share that. They've never been able to deal with that. And often, shame and guilt, and we know guilt is a hell of a lot better than shame, right? We also know that Benet Brown, who's also a social work professor, has done a lot to talk about shame, sort of made that the it word of, of right now. But shame is like somehow or other, I'm not enough. I didn't do enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not be enough. And I argue with you that every family that comes to you is wounded in that way. They feel wounded, and when you go back and you do the genogram, you're gonna have much more compassion and much more empathy. Because families can be pains in the neck. You don't have to always like them when you're working with them. So which, which came first, or did these all like come all together? We don't know. So you have to take a look, see internet, food, shopping, gambling, work, sex. Which came first? And which one do you want to attack first? And again, where are you going to send somebody? So let me just do really quickly the addictive cycle. There's a belief system, which goes into impaired thinking, which goes into the addictive cycle which goes to unmanageability, and again, this might not be new to you at all, but I like this, which becomes preoccupation. There's nothing else I can think of. Ritualization, I'm gonna keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. Compulsive behavior, oops, wire to go. And despair. And there we have shame and guilt. You know, you can get these, uh, it, they're on my website, okay. so you can go to my website and see this. And again, this is what we think about, the addiction interaction. It's a black hole that we go into. We end up in codependent, post-sex addiction, traumatic bonding, love addiction, romance. We end up with food. We fall in love with food, we fall in love with money, um, we can't have enough, we lose a lot, um, and we end up sort of miserable, right? Because when we're in the mess, of, and the families are miserable also, okay? Families are also miserable. So when we think about sex addiction, and Lori Gina, if you hadn't gone to hear her, I really encourage you to hear her again that 6% of the population are affected by sexual compulsivity. I probably think it's really more, especially now with the internet. Everything is so accessible. It wasn't always that way. But we rely on what? For sex, for comfort, right? You know, when you're little kids, you masturbate? Do you remember that? Okay, maybe none of you in this room did, but I know a few people that did. It's not a bad thing. Okay? Whew! Okay, are you, I don't want to insult anybody or not have you be welcome for that. But if you, <laughs> instead of hearing me, if you had to go out to your room and not get out of your room and not attend the conference, it does interfere with normal living and it does create a lot of consequences. So you know someone that is sometimes have you ever had anybody that, that really has been involved in, a, in really a compulsive sex addiction? It's sort of like they're in mania. So you want to rule out, by the way, um, manic depressive because it's a ma they're in mania. It's repetitive. It's a rapid cycle. I've had clients where they'll say to me, um, in the, the loved one honestly cannot not stop you know, whatever the self-simulation. And the reason they're doing it is to take away pain. It's self-soothing. 
Um, we know that it's an obsessive behavior. It, you're unable to perform daily class, and you have an inability to curtail activities. Does anyone have clients like that? Yes? Yes? OK, good. So you want to take a look and say, what's going on? Where are they missing? In the same way you would with someone with a substance abuse disorder. Where, 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 where's the missing gaps in their lives? Where are they really doing things? Ah, here it is. Are there severe mood changes? Like, I seem to pick a lot on Arthur, so I don't want to go pick on him. I'll just sit down next to you. What's your name? Melanie. Hi, Melanie. Hi. Do you want to go out after oh, this? Lord. Oh, my God. Okay, there's mood changes. I get so, did you see how excited I got? Marcy, oh, it's so good to meet you, honey. Um, I get so excited. But I, my mood will change. Do you guys ever, your mood changes, you know, when you, with your loved one? If you have a loved one, or you have a like one, or you have a partner, <laughs> or as I worked a lot on a college campus, I got a lot of people that just hooked up. And hooking up what meant having sex, make no mistake about it. It didn't. So when you talk to someone, like, take a look at what their relationships are. Who are they in relationship? How long have they been in relationship? What do they want to do? So here's one of my favorite ones, because I think if I was going to do something, um, you probably could put me in the compulsive I could be a compulsive shopper. I think this is going to go off the wagon. This is the one I might like. But do you know anybody that, and like the woman I told you about, she went and bought 300, 300 little, tiny. Does anyone have anything little, tiny, like, I don't know what they were, like animals or Christmas ornaments or whatever kind of things. And, or, they went out and they bought, they went to crystal shops or they went to the Bellagio and they came out with bags and bags and bags of goodies. Anyone in this room ever done that? Yes. Yeah? yeah? You did? Do you want to share? No. no? Uh. <laughs> That's a problem. So, but it becomes really difficult and then you don't know where to store them. So one of the things are, you, the best people in the world to talk to about who's a compulsive shopper is shopkeepers. And the way you know they have compulsive shoppers, because I talk to everybody. I talk to grocery clerks, I talk to shopkeepers, and everything is, does anyone have any um, charge cards I could borrow for a minute? Mm. No, look at you, you're all scared <laughs> to death. I'll go to this long lost relative, you only have one? It's been a long time, too. Two. You got three? <laughs> Thanks. So you're my shopkeeper, right? I just bought from you like all this stuff. You know, um, so I just bought about $10,000 worth of stuff. But you know, um, hey, could you put 2,500 on that? And here, I, I got $500 for you. I forgot, does anyone have $500 on them I can yeah. have? Yeah. Three. Three? You got 300 Yeah. Oh, give it to me. <laughs> right now? <laughs> you really want it? Yeah. Am I going to get it back? Well, I, I mean, I, I can't speak for that. I, I don't know. I mean, you just have to have blind trust in what I do. This is a good group. I can tell they came to Vegas. Oh, thank you. So, um, Todd, you know I wanted that thing over there from your store, but I only have 300 now, but you take this 300 and put the rest on this one, okay? Thank you, thanks a lot, okay. Oh! Excuse me! You'll get it back, I promise. And then, by the way, you got, well, you got Scott Wallach's card, so don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> So not only did I go into my cousin's wallet and took his cards, I now snookered her because she was so codependent and uh, <laughs> took her cards. And I'm like so heavy. I got a backpack now of goodies that when I get home, I'm still sad. I'm still empty. And I'm sorry, I got a drink. 
Or anyone got any pills on them? You better not say so. <laughs> Sugar, and I don't know, whatever you have is um, stuff. So we know that that can lead. And like, what a, I re you know, look at that, darling. <laughs> <laughs> and we know that sometimes, I recently did um, an intervention, he's just a lovely, lovely gentleman. He just was out of control. Um, and I don't know if I have his picture later on, but he ran up about a $150,000 bill at a very high-end LA hotel. He also needed to pay for a few women and they needed to come in his room. And then he needed, what's your name? Walt. Walt, can I make you my drug dealer? Absolutely. Oh, good. He loved <laughs> His drug dealer needed to come to Walt, and Walt had to be his deliverer. He came up to the room. You brought me some Coke. You brought me some pills. Um, no, you didn't bring me heroin. This one didn't use heroin. But a lot of coke, a lot of coke. I, I want to be high. I want that like really quick high. And um, when all was said and done, he had run up about 150,000. His wife had, was leaving him. His kids were leaving him. And um, he also like would dress the girls really nice. So um, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you will at the end, I promise. Yeah, it's okay, Todd. Todd's so ethical. If you <laughs> well, don't worry, everybody gets everything back. He's like so worried, he's already doing a, a amends. This is a great guy. Yay for the amends guy. I promise I don't keep anybody's money. Hard way to live. So. Look, in two seconds or less, oh, the other thing is I'm juggling accounts to make sure everything looks okay. And I'm really juggling accounts to make everything look okay because um, in my brain, which is the, the distorted image, and then, um, but oh, in high-end dress stores, you'll always know, you just ask them who the shoppers are, and that's how a very high-end person who has a shopping disorder shops. And since I moved to LA, there's a lot of people making money off of people who have shopping disorders. They're cleaning their closets and they're reselling their clothes. And they have so much clothes that they don't know, but they're feeling the empty hole. Very ripe, very ripe place for doing it. And um, so this was the woman that I was talking about before. Um, she was, had an impending divorce. She was drinking two bottles of wine per day. She wasn't taking care of her kid. Her kid was about ready to go to college. She could not stop. And she had a history of mania. So in terms of what we did to try and, and reach her is we really had to roll with her. And in this case, the payer which is really tricky. If you have someone who wants a divorce and the husband or wife is trying to hire you, please be very careful because it can be a non-intervention because the person will be so angry at their loved one because they want out of the relationship that it'll go south. So you really have to be careful. But the way we were able to reach her was really to talk to her about her relationship and say, hey, you know what, the guy you're with, he might be really a jerk, he also drinks, he also does things, and I hear you. And, and have other people that really love her, because if you would confront her with the person she wants to be divorced from, you're not gonna have an intervention. And we just really had to have a chat. So it wasn't like, and so sometimes, you know, you hear about all the formal kinds of things. And we learned what, which were really made her happy is she liked to make pottery. And she liked to do things with pottery. And the way we were really able to reach her was by looking at her artwork. Now, we couldn't have never known that. And we didn't put the husband who wanted the divorce into the intervention team, even though he was the payer. You know, 
That's what, so when you're doing complicated, you've got to go figure out where your leverage might be. And so to make Todd happy, I'm going to go return your money now because he looks so much. Here, here. Card two. So, well, do I have to do both? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> He's like a word nervous wreck. I'll give these back to Scott. I don't know where your other one went. Did you three? I really don't know. There were three. Someone who has Scott's other one? Uh, who has the other one? Who? Oh, thank you. Yeah, see what happens? You yes, you have a question? Sure. How many, the question is, can you hold that question? How many people are too much in an intervention team before it becomes unwieldy? Um, you know what? Um, the largest team I've ever had was probably about 16 people, but I had to like really manage them, and that's pretty much unwieldy. But it depends. Sometimes, and usually you look for uh, outliers. I would say 10 is the most, and then if you have other people, they might be uh, out of town. You might, there is a way to incorporate people that are out of town into it. Um, we, we did an intervention and they had a huge, huge family, and some people couldn't come, and it was sort or we used people that are dead and we put pictures of them up. Um, but one of the more effective things we did was this was this was a young man who um, had been in seven treatment centers, and his parents were highly they were ill themselves, um, and the family all came together for the very last time. He had legal consequences, so he's a great candidate for an external motivator to capture internal change. And the family wanted everybody in the world to participate, but some people were overseas and everything. And we had a big conference room in a hotel, and I had different people. This is one of the few times I wrote letters. And in the middle of this round circle in this hotel room, I threw on the floor the letters and said, these other people are with us. And if I felt it was appropriate, um, I would have read one of those. But at the same time, I had a genogram that went that big that I made of the family so he could learn all about his family. So you have to, you know, it's good to have a coach when you're doing these things to figure out how much is a much. And then if you have two people, you could manage. If you're one person and you got 16 people, you're not going to manage it. Um, Gambling. So we've talked a little bit about gambling. How many of you have ever known anyone who's a gambling? What did they gamble on? Everything. So if you went to the gambling talk, how many of you went to the gambling talk yesterday? One of you. Okay. So we know that people who gamble, they're at high risk for suicide, right? We also know that there's some kind of repetitive, I swear to you, casinos are great. I remember my mother used to love triple, triple diamonds, which means she liked the slot machines. And when she lived in Vegas, there were sidewalks. Frank Sinatra was alive. And downtown was where you got, for a dollar, free shrimp cocktails. OK? But it was the sound. And here you see someone. You go back and back in the ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. There's something so soothing about it. It's almost like a lullaby that feeds you back. And also because it's based on what, what, what prin what's principle? Um, gambling is based on what? It's based on behaviorism. It's intermittent reinforcement, right? So every once in a while, wow. Here's one. I know someone won $900 on an intervention, just won $900. She's always so lucky. Um, when she's the there. dollars you had, that was my winnings from last night. Oh, well then you didn't really <laughs> win them then. I can win them. I won $300 this morning, so see? <laughs> so, but it's really like if you won and then you had to go back again and again. And honestly, if you go anywhere, I get in the Bellagio, you can see this. You can see this. Um, and you can see this with off-track betting. How many of you like sports or men? You're the only one who likes sports. Nobody else in this room bets on, doesn't like, oh, you don't like football, you don't like soccer. But that's high, high, high stakes betting. Offshore betting, right? 
Um, how about I just bet you that I don't finish this on time, right? I'm betting, right? How many of you gamble in the stock market? 401k's cuz count. So think of it different ways. How do you gamble? Different ways. Scratchers. How many of you play the lotto? I'm sure one day we're going to win, right? Yeah, you're going to win, Deb? Three million. Is that all? Okay, I want a third then. Thank you. Ah, just like that. But you do have, we do have cases where they just keep borrowing money and there's limits that they'll do it. And sometimes, you know, when you're lonely, what's better than to go someplace? They're going to give you drinks. They're going to, there's a companion. There's a soft, soothing sound. Um, and those of you that are in EAP, I don't know how many of you work with the reservations or with the gaming industry here in Nevada um, to see. And there are treatment centers that are highly specialized just for people that have gambling addiction. And if that's primary, and you'll see a lot of people, a lot of older adults. Why? Because they're lonely. They don't have anything else to do. They can go there. They can be recognized. They can eat. They can do things. So we sold everything. We sold everything. We just had to have that one last bet. Anybody been to the horse races? OK, I, I think we're, we have a candidate here. What is your first name? Pam. Pam, we need to talk afterwards. Thank you. She wanted her money back, but do we really want to give her her money back or set a boundary? So when you're putting together a team like that, oh, obviously the loved ones may have experienced loss, right? And there may be grand monetary loss. So when you're putting together a team, a lot of times you're going to be looking for is there any money left for treatment? What kind of monies are available for treatment? And then again, where are the best treatment centers in the country? Even if they have substance abuse, they may not treat gambling. And you want to make sure that you're sending someone to a place that has expertise, that people have gotten certified. Um, and they're certified with gambling. And sometimes you get very high profile people. <clears throat> Recently, I had an opportunity to put together a team for someone that's very high profile, was in the news. They were a high stakes gambler, but really, but the, what the team really wanted, they really wanted this person to be able to play in Europe, whatever their sport was. And they really weren't interested in stopping the problem, they were interested in not losing the sponsors. So you really have to be careful and work where a person is. And, and when you're putting together, if you get have the luxury of putting together an intensive, you want an ASAM psychiatrist, that's an addiction medicine board certified psychiatrist who's published in gambling. You want someone on the team, if you're doing someone that's very high profile, that understands whatever their high profile thing is, that's also certified in gambling addiction. You want a good family therapist that can help change the family system, um, because sometimes very high profile people are not going to be going to treatment centers. You're going to be putting together a treatment team to help them. And you want, to, and you want at least a minimum of a six month <coughs> agreement to begin to work with them. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to do it. So here's some really good um, for things. You're going to validate. You're going to, and what are the consequences? How can we take care of everybody? He's doing it. Recently, we had a phone call from a woman. Her husband is acting out. He has a, he has a lover or he has a four-year-old with someone else. He had just transferred $800,000 into another account. And he wants a divorce. And he's doing offshore betting. And again, there was that divorce thing in it. Red flag. How are we going to get him to get the help he needs without getting angry of who the payer is? So really, I, want, I, I guess because that's happening to me a lot, I want to really like, have you be careful with that. So this is the 48-year-old male I talked to you about. No, it wasn't any of these high profile, but it could have been one of them. I live in LA, and there's a whole lot of people that are just like them. They were cocaine, alcohol, compulsive spending, debtor, sex, gambling, and trauma. And the thing that got, sometimes 
the most unlikely people will get the loved one to treatment. And again, if you're, if you're able to and you have permission, oftentimes it'll be an outlier, it could be a friend, that no one wants to be part of the intervention process. Right, Lori? Nobody wants to be part of the intervention process because, oh, they don't know anything. Or we don't want our 15-year-old son to be part of it because we don't think he wants to be involved. We don't want him to know anything. And guess what? That 15-year-old, that 10-year-old, even that 5-year-old knows that daddy's sick. And in this case, two things got this person to go. One was a friend. The friend had actually said, you must call me. Um, and because that friend had given them a very expensive Rolex. He sold it. Then he borrowed about $25,000 from that friend. He blew it. And he had two sons. They were, I don't know, 13 or 10. And the only way he went was not from his parents, because his parents really like kept saying, oh, that's just the way he always is, You're like a 42-year-old. We spent so much money on him, we're not going to help him. But maybe we'll help him. But we don't like him. I had to convince them to pay for treatment, because he had run up this 200000 you know, a lot of money. But who got him to treatment? was this friend and his son who said, you know, Dad, you can't come to my rugby game. I can't, you can't be with me. And so we had to go to a center that could really begin to unravel all these issues. And then he had to come home and he had to get on medication because he really was um, bipolar and he didn't really want to get on any medication. And he would call me and say, well, I'm back home, but I really don't want medication. But really, his, his, his whatever it was, it wasn't all the different diagnoses, which Lori Jean talks so beautifully about. It was all of the above. And so it wouldn't be helpful. It was just really his, his need, and really what it came from was shame and guilt from when he was a child, and how money was withheld and given withheld and given in such a way. I love talking about technology. Can everybody pull out their phones now? OK? So one of the things, if you want to go to, I wrote a great blog on kids and addiction. But when we look at it, think about how much you're addicted to technology. Earlier you talked about, I'm there 50, 60 times a day. And guess what? How many of your treatment centers have a digital policy? What is it? What's your, what's your treatment center's digital policy? They don't, get their phones. they don't get their phones. What's your digital policy at Newfound Life? No electronics. No electronics. Anybody have a treatment center? Yes, what's yours? Uh, two hours a day. Two hours a day. Yes? Open while they're good. When they're bad, they, get, they call them. Open while they're good. So that means they could have a 24-7? OK? Anybody else? No, no thing. I, I ask, I invite all of you, when we are present, we cannot be on our phones. We cannot be present to our being. Um, and so I invite all of you to take a look at your digital policies of today. The web is the most amazing thing in the world. And we have someone in the room, we have Wes, who doesn't incredible marketing. We have the founders of Addiction Blog right in front of them. These people are geniuses on the web. But they will also tell you that this could be something that really can take people away from who they are, depending on how many hours. Right now, today, we have what's called late talkers. These are children that don't talk. And the reason a lot of them aren't talking or they're being looked at them on the autism spectrum is because they're being babysat. I mean, when I grew up, I had a black and white TV, OK? And some of you, when you grew up, you had a really nice colored TV. And you had the Moffats, I mean, the Muppets and the Moffats. But we've got a lot of social anxiety. And we've got people 
that um, just text. For example, there's a wonderful place in Los Angeles. It's called Teen Line. It is the largest suicide hotline in the country for teens. And they get, um, their, it's a peer-based program um, operated out of Cedar sinai Hospital. The majority of their communications are texting. The kids text when they are, and that's their highest priority of responding. So people don't even know how to talk to one another. In fact, what's your name? Steve is already texting to Arthur over here about what this presentation's about, but they don't talk about how they are, or how many texts, I, I can't even believe how many texts I'm doing a day. When I go like, can we just talk on the telephone? You know, I can't even type, my finger hurts. The other thing we're seeing is marijuana is, yes. Yeah. Well, I think that there has to be ways to monitor, but I think there is a wonderful, this came from um, a different place. The best place I know in the country for gamers or for internet addiction where you're going deep, deep, deep in the web is a place called Restart. And it is up in the Seattle, Washington area in a place called Heaven's Field. Most of their clients are heavy, heavy gamers. They are, um, they were addicted to marijuana. First, they're probably going to a wilderness program and they have to be substance, uh, substance free. But there also is some really good research on what you should be doing. So I do have a good blog on my website and there's a, there's a website called Kids in the House. It's called Kids in the House, it's out of Los Angeles. And there's a lot of stuff written so if you, any of you have younger children or know people with younger children, none of you in the room know anybody with younger children. <laughs> let, let, me, let, me, let me see if you're awake. I have two. Okay, good. There's some really good guidelines, but we have to do it. I think one is it like, I like, um, I mean, Lori Jean, when so, and I don't do this, so I have to try and learn how to do this. When someone goes to Lori Jean's house, she has a basket and they're going over for dinner, and they put in the basket their phones. And like I know recently I was at her, her center, I, you leave your phone at the door. You know, you leave it there so I can be present with you. If you are working with a family, and you're, you're an interventionist or a treatment provider, and you can see your phone light up, you're not being with that family. You put it away and you ask them to put theirs away because that time is precious. And you can tell when you're talking on the phone, I do a lot of work on the phone, when somebody's on their computer or some, and I've been guilty of that every once in a while, uh, and they'll go, shh, there's a shh. And I go, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just shushing, you know? Or have you ever taken your, oh, how many of you have taken your cell phone into the bathroom? <laughs> that flush. That automatic flush here at the Bellagio. <laughs> no, where are you? Oh, I'm, I don't know what that was. It was like that. Things were going off. Oh, my God. But I, I want you, when you're starting to look at people now, I want you to do a biopsychosocial on the use of technology. Because you're also going to be asking people to withhold something that's very stressful for them. And you're going to get executives and executives say, what do you need? I need my personal assistant. Or I need this. My lifeline. But by the way, oh, and by the way, the hardest thing to do with parents, how many of you work with parents when you're doing interventions? And they, a lot of us work with families. So what does the family not want? their loved one to give up, then what are they paying for? They pay for their cell phone, right? And they say, Marianne could tell you, I can't give up that person's cell phone. Are you kidding me? It's my lifeline to them. I know where they are. And my teammate and I, we say, well, guess what? You now are paying for their drug dealer because that cell phone 
is a phone call to their drug dealer, not to you. So every time you pay that cell phone, if we want to cut off, and I know that sounds really mean and cruel, but if I want someone to move to change, I want that phone away. If you really need to find them, we, can, we have other ways of finding that person. But if you're paying for their drug deal, make no mistake about it. So your choice, if you still keep it because you have an imaginary fantasy in your head that this is going to help you find where they're, where they're living with a GPS, I got news for you. Their phone is, is, is full of people, places, things and that they shouldn't be doing. More important than what you're paying for. One of the biggest challenges you're going to have with families when you begin to work with them. So when we think about it, we want to look at interventions also mean macro. And that means what are we going to do in the community? What are we going to work face to face, less screen time? And again, what's your digital policy? And how are you going to help teach people to digitally detox? So I'm going to go on to mental health disorders now. Let's see how we're doing. Um, and I'm probably going to jump because I want to make sure. All of you know, do all of you understand that the DSM-5 is a billing? It's a billing system. And maybe it's helpful, but it's not a way of just categorizing people. It's a billing system. So you know in graduate schools of social work, psychology, they don't teach the DSM-5. Why? Because it's just a billing system. So what I want you to do is not look at people in terms of categories. I want you to look at people as if they are people who have problems in living. And we all live on a um, continuum. That's what I would prefer you doing. So I want to give you a recent um, case study of what one person was that really was what we call beyond a triple threat. And how did we do? This young gentleman was paraplegic. He had been in a terrible car accident at age 16, at which point his body was severed, and he ended up um, in um, being paraplegic. He also had disordered eating. Why? Because he was eating through, he had to do food tubes, but he didn't like to eat because the way his stomach was severed, when he went to the bathroom, he um, would go sometimes in his pants and it would have a terrible smell. So he was embarrassed. He, he also had what we call a TBI, a traumatic brain injury. And when he was tested, his IQ was, was about 90, I don't know, it was low. Um, the other thing was he was culturally different. Um, he was culturally different in the respect that he was a first generation Hispanic. His family of origin only spoke Spanish, but he had caretakers that were um, estate, uh, state people that managed his estate. They were all English speaking and everything and they managed the money and they didn't really like the family because they never bothered to get a Spanish interpreter to speak to them. On top of it, he was given the diagnosis of borderline. Okay? I mean, that was what they had diagnosed him with. He was borderline. And he liked meth. And he had um, a process addiction in which he had a sex addiction. Oh, and one other thing I forgot to tell you is he was gay. And that was really against cultural beliefs. And our job was first, where do we even start? That's a very complicated case when we even begin to think about how are we going to get him to a treatment center and what, treat, and what are we going to have treated first and who could actually care for someone like this? Because it does require you know, um, first floor, it requires ramps, it requires someone uh, that has medical because even though he could change his tubes, he could also drive his own car. He had a car that was specially equipped. And we had to decide what we're going to deal with, um, you know, where will they, they had to be culturally sensitive. It would be great to have someone that had Spanish speaking available for the family. 
and we had to do two types of movements to change. One, we had to put together all the payers. There was a lawyer, a stockbroker, a money manager, accountant, who was very controlling. We had to learn their whole family background as well as learn the family's background, which we had to do in Spanish. So that's a pretty complicated intervention um, that we had to do. And we had to get him to say yes, right? That would be, you know, it'd be nice if he said yes. So while he has a process addiction, which was acting out sexually, that was not the first, we had to put that in the priority, his meth. His meth use, his physical capabilities, his physical needs in finding a treatment center. In terms of getting him to yes, we actually only had to meet with one person. Can you imagine how overwhelming it would be for someone who has a short attention span, who has a TBI, and people are telling him what to do in English and Spanish at the same time? So there was someone who worked in a outpatient facility that he connected with, had nothing to do with the treatment center and everything, but we really worked through her to help to get to yes. In the meantime, our jobs were to get these two circles of very disparate people to try and be on the same page or not to control the outcome. And the biggest people we had to change were the payer people because they were really controlling. Um, he did say yes, but then there was the other problem. No one told us he had a dog, a puppy, and he really felt the puppy was very important. So we also then had to find out. So when we talk about triple threat or process addictions or complex addictions, we want to make sure that you try and cover all the bases of it. Um, it's a miracle he's still in extended care. I have no idea. I can't tell you what the miracle was. I can't tell you that we were fabulous. He fired me at least three times because I did case management and he hated me at least three times if not four, the consent form was taken away from me. Because one minute he liked me and the next minute, I don't like that lady. What's her name? I don't know her, but she's mean. I mean, and four times a consent form taken away. That was almost, a, you know, I've had them taken away a lot. And then they love my partner. He's so nice. Well, he's not, he doesn't have duty to warn um, some of the time. Um, this is another one where we were really challenged. This is, um, but is this one had um, was involved in a kink relationship. Has anyone ever been involved in a kink relationship? You don't have to tell me. This was again a woman whose husband was um, a doctor, who was whose wife was using pills. She had used pills for many many years. She also had. Um, a, hit, a previous history, she had a period of sobriety, but she was using it. But she decided she, she had six children at the same time. So she would have been really a great candidate um, for you. But right now she was involved in a kink relationship. So, that, so my partner signs me up on the kink site. So a wheezy of something or other is now on the kink site. And what for fun, she was also seeing a kink therapist. Um, and the kink therapist told me that they were once my student, because I was a professor at San Diego State, and that she knew better than the Meadows where I was trying to get this person to go to first, and then you guys second. And meanwhile, on her buttocks, she had been branded with this person. And when I went to her home, there were a lot of religious icons, tremendous amount of religious icons. There were sex toys all over the house. There were pills all over the house, and there were six, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, there were six children. They were in private parochial school, and um, she, didn't, she didn't want to see me. She didn't want to see my partner. We brought security with us. I don't know why. I just felt that it was uncomfortable 
that somehow or other in this case, sometimes you feel like you need someone else. So I brought this gentleman, his name is John Henry. He's fabulous. I'm lucky enough sometimes to get him. He's usually shadowing Paul McCartney. He works for um, a secure, he was a, a Santa Monica LA PD guy. He's just so gentle and so loving and he knows how to wait and not like get nervous because people who have worked sometimes in PI or security um, in police, they wait a long time for people to talk. So they have more patience. What's a kink relationship? A kink rela what's a kink relationship? Anyone to tell what a kink relationship is? It's a master-slave relationship. Um, you all have a variety of different lovers. You might be branded. You do sort of kinky things. So it's different. Um, and there's no right or wrong about it. It's just what she chose to engage us. So I can't value judge the kink relationship or the kink site. It was just a matter of what do I do? And because there were children involved, the only thing I really could do is I tried to join up with her and she really wasn't having it. Her therapist, oh, by the way, if you have an outside therapist, try and call them and see whether they'll align with you. Because if they don't align with you, um, and sometimes you can just call up and I go, hi, I'm Dr. Stanger, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I've been employed by da 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 to help with solve the family problems of da 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 da. I understand that you're bound by HIPAA and you may or may not be able to speak with me. But I want you to know that we're, gonna, we're really concerned about the health and welfare about this person and we'd like to talk with you. 97% of the time the therapist is really open and nice and there is a stretch of HIPAA. Most ASAM psychiatrists know this. Most therapists don't know that they can talk to you. So you can be able to talk to people. Um, this particular therapist wanted nothing to do with us and said that she knew how to do it better. So the only thing we were left to do was, because there were little children and there were sex toys all over the house and reporting and the, and the school, I did in my lifetime report to Child Protective Services. It doesn't really make a difference, but I did do that as the invitation to change and work with the family. And in this case, there wasn't, the treatment solution was the person stayed with their therapist, that's what they wanted to do, and they were getting divorced. So not all of them have happy outcome. That wasn't my outcome, but that's what happened. But we worked really hard to change the family system. Um, let's see. We have time for two more. This is a wonderful young girl who had uh, obsessive compulsive borderline and disordered eating and was a hoarder. Um, she was lovely. To give you a little bit background of our family, her mother was about six feet tall. She had been married twice. She was a, a professional, like a lawyer. She was a rager. She grew up in a family where her mother was a Holocaust survivor. Her brother, who I met, he was gorgeous. He used to say to me, you know what? I only like borderline women. That's what he said. I said, well, have you read Randy Kruger, Stop Walking on Eggshells? I mean, I, I don't know what you do with the, And he would get multiple marriages. The um, father of this young girl was once a famous psychologist. And God bless him, he had had uh, a stroke or something. And I don't hope I don't offend anybody, but all he could say is it, he, 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 he was a savant, he was really smart, but he kept saying, oh, you fucking motherfucker, run, 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 run. And all he, that's all he kept saying. And the young girl had a younger brother who was developmentally disabled. Can you imagine you, she's two years old, and her brother's born, and he has, you know, he's never gonna go beyond being six years old even though now he was 14. So you talk about abandonment issues and everything. Our job was, because the mother wanted her to go to a particular treatment center, was not just to get her to a treatment center, because this, this person had no substance abuse disorder. They were obsessive compulsive, borderline. She wanted her to go to a treatment center that required when it's straight mental health, the first thing they had to do is they wanted a TB test, an assessment. Now, the, oh, I forgot to tell you, there's a quarter. Like, the whole room was like this, 
plus the living room where we held the intervention, if you can imagine a Pepperidge Farms cookie bag crumpled in the middle of the table where we were talking, and we weren't allowed to move it. Like I was not allowed, and I wasn't allowed to sit here either, because that was her place. Our job was to get her to CVS for a TB test, because in order to get admitted to where she wanted, because it was mental health, they had to have a TB test. And our other job was to get her to the treatment center for an assessment. And we're looking at ourselves and we're saying, are you kidding me? That's hard. I don't know, and I always think there's some God thing with us when we do this. We couldn't keep them in the same room because the mother would just rage and rage and yell. I went outside with her and I said, hey, this is pretty awful here, isn't it? How about if you can help me find this treatment center? I was brand new to LA. I had no idea where to go. And she was like a savant. She knew all the directions. So she said, OK, I'll go with you, because it was really awful. Her mother was just screaming and yelling. God must have been with us, because I can't tell you that we did anything perfect, but we moved everybody out of the way. We allowed the father to have a glass of cognac, because he said that the mother would never give him cognac when he lived in the house, and there was this big chest of cognac. For three days, we never moved that, that, that cookie thing, never moved it. And I never sat where I wasn't allowed to sit. And when you think about this girl and the pain, because the mother was also a hoarder, it wasn't just getting them to a treatment center. It's also getting someone to come in their house very cheaply to help later for cleaning, to help that knows how to help someone like that. The total was invitational. We ended up being able to get her to go to outpatient. No, she wouldn't go to inpatient. She hadn't left the house for four months. I think that she was in pain. It was the right time. But those are sort of complicated in I want to end with one more. And that's one, there's people that intervene. I've got a lot of failure to launch. I'm so sorry, I've got so many. But I want to end with older adults. Because my generation, you get the luck of the draw. The people that were born 1946 and above, we're aging. We're aging at a rapid rate. We're older adults. And make no mistake about it, we're experiencing loss. We're experiencing late onset substance abuse. We've got physical difficulties. We've got loss of a spouse or a partner, loss of friends. Um, you know, have you ever did it? Um, I did a wonderful, complicated intervention. And you have to be willing to work a long time when you're talking about process. A woman was a nurse at one time, but she was shooting up Dilantin into her leg. She was one of three sisters. The sisters were all pissy, but God bless them, they loved her. This woman, we learned, was earlier in her life was molested by her father. She had sort of a hoarding capability, obsessive compulsive process was hoarding never throwing anything away, very codependent. She had a daughter that she lived with um, who didn't work. This woman didn't work. The father who hired me was really feeling guilty because he did it, and the two sisters were really annoyed. Well, when I met her, and by the way, I never met her. So you can do an intervention and coach someone and never meet them. If you don't, you don't have to always be there. If you've got a good family that's willing to work, Honor them. This family called me up. She was in the hospital. She had to stay in the hospital. You can't move someone with a big, with six inch wide wound. Then she went to a nursing, a uh, special care unit in a nursing home. Then she went back to the hospital. Then I had to like, do you know how hard it is with an open wound staph infection to beg a treatment center that's hospital based to take them? Go talk to Deb Kelts. She was yelling at me. And she said, you know, Louise, we really, I said, you're going to have to take her. And we, had a, we worked from what we call a change agreement. While she was in the hospital, she had to sign a change agreement that she would agree not to return home when this wound healed, but she would agree to go to Hemet Valley Recovery. And this is a woman that had been using for maybe, I don't know, 10, 12 years. 
and it was pretty rocky. Somehow or other, we used a change agreement. She didn't like me. She never met me, and she was always bad-mouthing me in the beginning. I want, the blessing is, is somehow or other, they did the magic. We got her here, and I continued working with the family until they didn't really need me anymore. They were pretty well doing it on her own. We put it together with life skills. She ended up having to close down her house. She ended up not enabling her daughter anymore, who was a heavy marijuana user. The gift I got was I got an email serendipitously, and it thanked me. It said, thank you so much. I now am living in Hemet. I sold my house. No, I don't have a job yet, but I'm working and I'm volunteering every day, and I have a job in sight. Complicated? Yes. Impossible? No. I invite all of you, first of all, I want to, can you all stand up and applaud yourselves? <laughs> Woo! I invite all of you to work with your heart, to learn sometimes with your head, with your heart, and to act with your feet. I think that's how Lori would say it, or heart, head, feet, think, heart, help, feet. And not to be afraid, if you have questions, when you get these kinds of cases, there's people, reach out. You know, the best thing in the world anybody can do is be a mentor to someone else. It's because that makes them learn better and everything. And take a look at the whole picture of your client. See, when you use portraiture, you may not be able to handle everything at first, and you may start out with one but not the other, but you have that robust kind of knowledge that will allow you to help pick, to help choose. And along the way, by the way, success is not measured by the number of quick emits you get. Success is nothing, there's a saying that Jerry McDonald says, nothing changes till something changes. And until that system begins to change, and you believe that that system can change, then you have made a difference. So bless you all for the work you do. Any questions? And I know I kept you a little bit. Enjoy your awesome. And if you can, leave me your card. Bring me your cards. <laughs>